All right. Hi, everybody. So as promised, here are the final videos on South Africa. Not sure if it's going to be a two-parter, three-parter. We'll see how long this one takes. And without further ado, here we go. So these slides, I don't really think I need to talk our way through too much. Hopefully they're self-explanatory. I encourage you to pause the video from time to time and really analyze what you see here. But this is essentially a map of decolonization, right? Keep these key dates in mind. We talked in class about why there are two different dates. There's sort of a date range here. That's interesting. We can talk about the Boer War as the reason why 1910 is a date here. But again, 61, that's when a, a new constitution is written in South Africa, actually. But the idea that there's a date range for South African independence is indicative of itself. It's an ambiguous process in South Africa when compared to many other African nations. And this map obviously is a map of the resources throughout all of the continent of Africa. This is a zoom in of South Africa and it's very important for us to be aware of the gold deposits in South Africa because that is one of the, of course, um, major sources of capital from South Africa and that's one of the major reasons why uh, the black population was so exploited for their labor. There's also an abundance of coal but you guys can read, so I'll encourage you to look at that on your own. By the way, as always, these are the, well, not as always, actually, you have access to these slides, right? And so all these numbers correspond to the review slides that you can access. So all these links you can click and you can control F your way through any of these concepts if you're confused. Yet again, just a really interesting map, especially now that we know what is going on after 1948, of course, right, the election, note the spike of gold production in South Africa. So isn't it curious that in the years that the South African government really doubles down on its apartheid policies, also we see this spike in gold production. And we haven't gotten here yet in the semester, or rather in the unit, we'll do that next semester, but it's interesting to see this precipitous decline leading to the end of apartheid in 1994. Cool. Okay, just overlaying that with some images of the people working in the mines. I don't feel like I need to read this stuff. I want to keep these reasonable in length. Okay, cool. So again, lots of maps. Did I mention I like maps? All right, just really cool stuff, right? Overlays of resources population density. This is fascinating. If you guys are super curious and you don't even care about studying at this point, you just want to learn more, click on this stuff. It's cool. It's interesting how the Afrikaner population, or rather, not the Afrikaner population, so to speak, but the area where the most Afrikaner, uh, Afrikaans speaking people, rather, are located, right? You see, also happen to be a little bit more sparsely populated. So when we look forward and remember that the Afri that supporters of the National Party were not only largely Afrikaner, but they also lived in the rural areas, these maps can really come in handy to help us understand that further. More stuff. Okay. So even though we see, you might say, well, wait, Ms. Sutton, these maps contradict that, right? Look, the mixed race population is in that area that you just indicated. That is true. But realize also that the white population overall in South Africa was the minority population. So hopefully that further explains why these maps look the way they do. Really fascinating stuff here. And of course, remember that this is all modern day. We sort of started from the end and went back to the beginning to learn more about the legacy of apartheid. But with that said, let's go back to the beginning and work our way forward. Okay, so the Boer War, I realize we didn't actually go over this explicitly in class, so I'm not going to make this a key term, but I think hopefully this will help you guys understand sort of the way in which there were two different white populations in South Africa as well, and they actually were in conflict with one another before South Africa was actually founded as a country. So let's go back then, shall we? So way back when South Africa was still colonized by white people, it actually was separated into four separate states, four separate regions, right? And so some of them were British colonies and some of them were Dutch colonies. The Dutch actually settled, the Dutch were the first European explorers to settle in South Africa. The British came later. 
Uh, in the late 19th century, right around the same time, or actually the mid 19th century, I think, but as time went on, it got worse, right? In the mid to late 19th century, I forget the exact year, gold was discovered in the Transvaal region. And uh, the British and the Dutch go to war over it. And ultimately, the outcome of the Boer War was that the British were victorious. But in order to make sure that the British whites and the Afrikaner whites could coexist, the first constitution of the Union of South Africa, which is what happened to these four regions after the war, they merged and became the Union of South, South Africa. What happened was the British were so nervous about what could happen if they upset the Afrikaner population. They ended up writing a constitution that gave a lot of power to the Afrikaner people. And in the process also, it was a constitution that was very oppressive to the black population. And we know more about that, but anyway, that's really what this bullet point is trying to get at. Okay, moving forward. We talked about these two concepts. It is important for you to remember the difference between de facto and de jure. Uh, I like to think if you think about the fact that jure, if you think jury, you might think law, right? So these things are pretty self-explanatory, right? The idea that de jure segregation is something that actually is written into law and de facto segregation is something that just happens, right? There's no law written about it, but it happens for a number of different reasons. It could be cultural, it could be economic, right? And we still have examples of de facto segregation in the United States, right? We looked at that map from the New York Times. I did not put that on these slides, but if you want to look at it again, just Google mapping segregation, New York Times, and you can find it. And then of course, hopefully you remember that we looked at the pillars of segregation, right? And this was a broad concept, but then we applied it to South Africa by actually analyzing some of the policies before apartheid even began. So before 1948, right, after the Boer War, after South Africa became a unified country, how apartheid was already in the making before it officially started. So let's talk about that, right? So these are key terms that you guys should hopefully already remember, right? This one really matters. You should very much remember the Native Urban Areas Act because that's what first sets up the past system. We actually went back to the past system in our last class of this week, um, the Native Lands Act, it's a similar concept, but this one is more about segregating rural areas, and this one's about urban ones. So hopefully you can remember, right, Native Urban Areas Act, obviously urban is in the name. Native Lands Act, that one is about segregating rural spaces, right? Note how early these are, right? Not too long after South Africa became a nation. The reason why there are two dates here is it's all about the numbers. In 1913, the amount of land allocated to the black population was about 7% of all of South Africa's land. In 1936, they raised that percentage to 13. But still, if you consider the ratio of black to mixed to white South Africans, it still was not nearly close to the overall percentage. So it wasn't really, I guess, what we could call equal representation or rather proportional representation. Still, black South Africans made up the majority of the population and yet they had an overwhelming minority of land access, right? And then you have laws that pertain to labor and work. Uh, so, right, this is set up actually before the past system, but what's really interesting is that these two things sort of build off one another once the past system is put in place, this sort of is strengthened, I suppose, in a way, right? Because not only do you need a pass to work in a certain area, since you already had to enter into a contract, right? There are multiple work-related ways that you could get in trouble, right? So these laws were almost set up to create criminals to pack prisons, Okay, and then the Mines and Works Act, right? This basically gives skilled occupations only to the white South African mine workers. And of course, you could hopefully infer that skilled jobs pay more than unskilled jobs. And then of course, in terms of power, and we really focused on political power, right? That parliament was only made up of white people. And even beyond that, that blacks could vote at this point, but the only people that they could vote for were white people that represented them. And by the way, once we get into apartheid proper, 
Black South Africans were entirely stripped of their voting rights. Cool. Speaking of, let's check on time here. All right, we're nine minutes in. I'm going to pause and then we'll do a part two. So stay tuned. <laughs> 